All righty, everybody. Uh, welcome to the BBB for Module 6, Chapters 21 through 26. Um, we're going to just be going over a couple of things to help prepare you guys for the exam tomorrow. All right, so the first chapter we're going to be looking over is Chapter 21, the Allergic and Anaphylactic Reactions uh, chapter. I'm just going to go over some different things of allergies and anaphylax anaphylactic uh, response in that compared to anaphylactic shock. All right, so... Um, Typically, when an antigen or an allergen enters the body, it usually gets fought off by the immune system. You know, this is our white blood cells and all of that recognizing that a foreign body has entered and it's not supposed to be there. So our defense mechanism kicks in to get rid of that uh, outside body source. <coughs> Typically, when that human comes in contact with that um, antigen or allergen, again, the body recognizes it and kind of goes into an overproduction mode or what we would call an allergic reaction. Um, an allergic rea reaction is defined as a hypersensitivity reaction resulting from that exposed allergen. The, in, immune system overestimates the danger of an allergen and produces an excessive response. Um, this is typically when you start to see hives, a uh, patient will be itchy, uh, they can be um, complaining of like shortness of breath or uh, really hot, maybe uh, reddish skin color, stuff like that, you know. Um, Typically, we can treat these people with what we call antihistamines or Benadryl or other type of antihistamine medications that can help reduce the response that the body is um, going into. So typically, an allergic reaction would be, you know, something we might be, we might consider minor, you know, that, like I said, simply patient complaining of itchiness, they have hives, you know, um, and normally we can treat it with Benadryl. Um, however, um, typically if a human is exposed to this constant allergen constantly or just a larger amount or the body just goes into a more hypersensitivity mode to where they just overreact, the immune system just really overreacts even more progressively than the allergic reaction. And this is typically when you will see that anaphylactic uh, phase. Anaphylactic phase is a more se severe stage of an allergic reaction. Um, this involves, this is now involving the systemic um, system. So this is causing your blood vessels to dilate, your blood pressure might drop, your heart rate's going to pick up, um, you're going to definitely see a response with the respiratory system, your bronchioles could be constricting, making it difficult for the patient to breathe, or respiratory rate is going to go up, um, um, multi-system life-threatening, uh, you know, this could affect different organs of the body, causing the human to pretty much go into shock, you know, and we call that anaphylactic shock. Um, typically, treatment for this patient would be immediate action of an epinephrine or EpiPen. You know, if there's a paramedic on board, they can administer Benadryl either through the muscle or as an IV. And, you know, just maintaining that airway. You want to provide oxygen if necessary and stuff like that and get them to the hospital immediately. An anaphylactic reaction is a severe, over-exaggerated allergic reaction. You will see swelling of the upper and lower airways, like I say, bronchoconstriction, um, constriction of the bronchioles, leakage from the capillary, capillaries, vasodilation, increased mucus production, and GI issues such as vomiting and crappy, cramping, abdominal pain. So you, your bronchioles are not only getting um, narrow, 
but you're also producing an overabundant abundant of mucus. So this patient's gonna be wanting to cough that stuff up, you know, spit it out, you you know, um vomiting and stuff like that is a major issue, especially if they can't control their own airway, they're at risk of aspirating on that. Um so pretty much just a full blown just self body attack is going on right here just from one exposure to pollen, dust, seafood, you know, typically things like that. Let's see. This is just a little diagram um, showing you uh, normal versus um, abnormal in reference to anaphylaxis. Uh, as you can see, the first one shows you what a normal bronchial would look like versus the bronchial constriction. As you guys, I don't, I don't know if I have a pen. Let me see. So this is a pretty much a narrow, I mean a normal um, bronchial that goes down into the alveoli. This is where gas exchange occurs, correct? And then you have your... You have your bronchoconstriction going on because this person was exposed to an allergen that now has caused their bronchioles to constrict and you have a narrow, narrow, narrowing of the bronchio itself. So this will make it difficult for that patient to breathe. As you can see with the narrow, with the smaller um, passage wave, it will be harder for this human to get oxygen down into the alveoli for that proper gas exchange causing them to go from a, what we consider perfusion to a hypoperfusion state. Um, then this just shows you uh, capillary permeability. You know, the capillaries are gonna now start releasing more uh, water into the body system, causing a human to just produce an abundant amount of mucus. And then, as I said, with your uh, arteries or vessels, you're gonna go for go from a normal um, diameter to a bigger vessel, which will decrease the amount of blood flow you have passing through the um, arteries and stuff like that, and you will see a drop in your blood pressure. Same thing with the upper airway. Um, it gets smaller, making it more difficult for human to breathe in air, stuff like that. They might complain of uh, like a swollen throat or just a uh, tightness around this area over here. Um, and then, like I said, with all this going on, they'll have a decrease in the blood pressure. You might feel a weak but rapid pulse and just poor tissue perfusion. So eventually they can go from that uh, hot, uh, fleshy, reddish skin to that pale, cool skin, you know, if actions aren't taken immediately. So, um, like I said, with the respiration, you will have the swelling in the upper airway that can cause obstruction and a reduction of air to the lungs while constriction and swelling of the bronchioles in the lower airway can lead to hypoxia that un inadequate gas exchange, right? Um, but the circulations, your blood vessels dilate and they lead to the hypotensive state, the decrease in blood volume. Um, and just know that it's a decrease in blood pressure, not due to blood loss, but just because of the vasodilation. And this is normally due to an overabundant amount of histamine that is produced. Um, histamine is described as the primary chemical mediator released from cells. Histamine causes the bronchoconstriction, vasodilation, and increase in capillary permeability. This is that mucus leakage. Um, causes of anaphylactic reaction, you have injection. Um, 
an antigen an injection is when an antigen is introduced directly into the body via this is a, like a bite a sting a bug sting from like a wasp bumblebee uh, needles or infusions um, Bee stings or in insect stings are pretty much the majority of severe allergic reactions in anaphylaxis. Um, you know, typically you will see this from your bees, yellow jackets, um, ants, and most bites are going to be like your localized reaction. Uh, we can see it from food such as peanuts, nuts, milks, eggs, seeds, berries can all cause anaphylactic reactions. Um, ingestion, patient has swallowed something, you have inhalation, the patient breathes, the substance starts into their lungs. So this could be like dust, pollen, just some type of antigen that's in the air that that human is allergic to. And in contact, which will be absorption, is the antigen is absorbed through the skin. So just think like poison ivy or like some type of powder, some substance that the human is um, allergic to. Um, some type of lotion, perfume, stuff like that, you know, something that is absorbed through the skin. <clears throat> so anaphylaxis management, you know, if your patient is alert, you want to administer oxygen, assess the circulation, so you want to feel the pulses and just do a quick secondary assessment, you know, assess their skin, look for hives, um, ask them if they're itching, stuff like that. Yes, you go ahead and administer their prescribed epinephrine or if we carry um, epinephrine, well, you can go ahead and administer it that way. Um, remember for an adult is 0.3 milligrams and for an infant or child is 0.15 milligrams via your IM. And we normally do this in the thigh muscle. If your patient is altered, however, you need to assess their airway. If it's open already, um, you assess the breathing. If it's adequate, just go ahead and put oxygen. If it's inadequate, so this is either do they have an inadequate respiratory rate or they're breathing too fast, or breathing too slow, or an inadequate tidal volume. You know, is it shallow, is it labored, stuff like that. You want to go ahead and manage uh, the um, breathing with positive pressure ventilation with some oxygen hooked up. And then you assess your circulation and move down into your um, secondary assessment. I think there's like a scenario. Yeah. So in this scenario, you guys, 27-year-old male found sitting on the ground near his garden, complaining of difficulty breathing. When asked, he states that he may have been bitten by something. You note know, wheezing. And all lung fills, tongue swelling, hives, a BP of 90 over 60, a blood pressure, pulse rate of 110, and he's breathing 28 times in labor. His EpiPen is on the pouch porch. What is the best course of action? Um, oxygen via non nasal cannula, 0 0.3 milligrams epinephrine via his auto injector. 0.15 milligrams epinephrine via his auto injector or assist him with 25 milligrams of Benadryl. So the answer for this one, you guys, would be that 0 0.3 milligrams epinephrine via his all his own auto injector. I know that this one gives him like a inadequate respiratory rate and breathing, but being that he is still awake and alert and able to answer your questions, go ahead and just um, administer the medication and just treat his response after. If he stays awake and alert, you know, just provide adequate treatment for that. If he decompensates, then, you know, go from there. Typically, once you give somebody um, their EpiPen or whatever, they still need to be transported to the hospital. All right. Toxicology. Uh, and this is the next chapter. Chapter 22. So we're going to get into some poisons and other environmental emergencies and stuff like that.
All right, so there's different type of poisons out there, just like there's different type of things that can cause an allergic reaction. Um, most common one is ingestion, you know, especially with children. Um, uh, this is children getting a hold to cleaning products, you know, just anything and everything under the sun that they can grasp in their hand and put in their mouth. Uh, a drug or substance that can be swallowed with absor absorption occurring through the GI tract or gastrointestinal tract, which is your stomach and your intestines. Um, common poisons are prescription meds, over-the-counter uh, medications. These could be either ac accidental or intentional. You know, um, these could be people who are overdosing to get that next high, or this can be grandma or papa that don't remember if they took their seven o'clock medicine, so they ended up taking it again at 10 o'clock, and now they're kind of like double dosing or, you know, taking multiple pills, like you see this a lot in the older, pop older population as well. Um, like I said, household products like soap and bleaches, you see that with the children. Um, and then also kids going outside eating certain plants and flowers, you know, just sticking everything and anything in their mouth because they, most toddlers and stuff usually explore via um, mouth. So they're curious. They want to taste everything. Um, inhalation, you know, that's pretty much, you know, you're breathing in a poisonous, typically it's a gas or vapor or fume. So this could be, you know, carbon monoxide or this could be, um, the aroma of some type of byproduct of some type of cleaning agent, anything like that. But um, typically inhalation, you breathe that stuff straight into your your airway, which goes all the way down into your lungs, um, into your alveoli, and they do the exchange into your blood system via the gas exchange over there with the alveoli and your capillaries around the area. Um, with inhalation of poisonous uh, substance, you normally see a rapid absorption into the body due to the substance reaching the alveoli. Um, whereas with the ingestion, it's typically longer because the body has to sit there and break it down, absorb it, stuff like that. Injection, this could just this could be you know injecting some type of drug into your system, stuff like that. Um, but this poison enters the body through the breakup of skin, usually by intentional injection, you know, someone shooting up a drug intentionally or by a stink or bite from an animal or insect, like wolf snakes, you know, especially snakes with like venomous snakes. An injection poison can cause an immediate reaction at the injection site, followed by a delayed systemic reaction. Remember, these bites can cause an allergic reaction and then lead to anaphylactic shock, like we just talked about. So pretty much a, a, fight, a bite um, from a snake or a wash would typically, you would see a reaction in that area that that human was bitten. And then later, um, if not treated, they will develop a systemic reaction because it has now been absorbed into the bloodstream and stuff like that. And then you have your um, last one, which is uh, absorption. A poisonous substance can enter the body when it, it contacts the skin or mucous membranes. The poisonous substance can be a dry powder or liquid. So once again, this is just like baby powder or um, poison IV, stuff like that. This is just a picture of a toddler doing some exploring, pulling out all the chemical um, solutions from the cabinet. Uh, so this is a, another little scenario. Ingestion, a drug or substance can be swallowed with absorption occurring through the GI tract. Um, ensure scene safety. You always want to maintain the airway. These patients may be altered, ventilate, and oxygenate if needed. Before transporting, bring the suspected poisonous substance with you 
whether it be plant particles or empty pill bottles, etc. So I always want to absorb the scene, preserve the scene, I'm sorry, and just look for any like things that are out of the ordinary. You know, if, like if you if you have your patient and you see like blue substance around their mouth and on their tongue, you know, just look around the scene. If you see something that looks like it might have contained some type of blue uh, solution or anything in it, uh, that might be what that patient ingested. And you might want to go ahead and just bring that to the hospital with you so that they can, um, I guess, you know, contact poison control or just go from there. Um, during transport, you want to, con and during transport, you want to consult medical um, control. Uh, this is so this is you telling them as you're giving your report on in route to the hospital, what you observe on scene, stuff like that, so they can kind of be at the ready. And you can also call poison control to see if there's anything you can do on your end. Um, and then you just go from there. You know, uh, activated charcoal. Um, I think I've seen this being being given one time. I had a patient who overdosed, overdosed on his metformin and they just made him swallow like a tube of this. Well, they put it in a cup and mixed it and then he had to drink it and he was just pretty much vomiting and having diarrhea for the remaining of my shift. I think I was on a clinical. <laughs> but the formal the formal dynamics behind this uh, is that the activated charcoal absorbs the poison while still in the stomach. So this is pretty much only useful for people who ingested something, someone who in, inhaled something or um, took something via um, injection or absorption through the skin. This activated charcoal is not going to be beneficial. This is pretty much for someone who took in something by the mouth. Um, but this absorbs the poisons while it's still in the stomach, and hopefully this limits the amount of poison that gets absorbed through the intestines um, and the lower GI tract. This we can only give this underneath the direction of medical direction. So you you can't just give it to give it. You need to get permission. Um, indication, like I said, if something was ingested by mouth, most effective when administered within the hour within the hour of ingestion. So if they took something and they contacted us in 30 minutes and said, hey, this person took something, you know, within 30 minutes, then we can administer the charcoal after getting approval from medical direction. And hopefully, you know, we can prevent that person's um, intestines absorbing most of that poison. Uh, contraindication, um, so if a patient has altered mental status, or so if they're not able to follow direction, if you can't say, here, take this cup of water and drink, and they don't follow command correctly, then you do not want to um, stick this activated charcoal into their um, system because they're at risk of aspirating on it. You know, they might not swallow and might end up choking on it. On, uh, it's also a contraindication if the patient has overdose on acids or alkalis like bleach, ammonia, and alcohol or overdose on cyanide and is unable to swallow. Doses is usually med control directs you how much to give. Those should be one gram per kilogram of body weight in adults and pediatrics. To administer, you want to shake very well and you have the patient drink it. You want to record the time that it was given. If the patient vomits, notify med control for authorizations of, to repeat the dose. Side effects, you know, you can let the patient know, like, hey, after you take this, you you will see, like, your, your bowel movements will be very black. They will be dark. And if he hasn't vomit, just let him know hey, this might make you throw up. And you're only allowed to repeat this one. So if he throw, throws up and medical control says give him another one, he throws up again, that's it. You, you're only allowed to do this one more time. So inhalation, um, like I said, inhalation of a poisonous substance is typically a gas, vapor, or fume, or aerosol into the lungs um, that enables rapid absorption into the body. Carbon monoxide from fires, huffer, or huffers, huffer patients. A huffer patient is someone who literally is 
probably somewhere closed off in the room and inhaling some type of chemical on purpose. You know, this is someone who probably sits there and sniffs gas because they're like, I like to smell gas. Or someone who buys Sharpies and just sits there and sniffs Sharpies all day, stuff like that. Um, so, um, in this case, you know, carbon monoxide is dangerous because it is an odorless um, gas that we are, you know, we're not we're not able to see gases at all. So it's an odorless gas. Um, so you, anytime that you suspect carbon monoxide might be in the air, you want to ensure scene is safe before you guys uh, arrive on scene. Remember, patient needs to be removed from the toxic environment, and you want to assess and maintain airway, regardless of the SpO2. Even if the SpO2 is 95 or greater, you want to put this patient on 15 liters per minute oxygen via non-rebreather. <coughs> because carbon monoxide has the st stronger affinity than um, oxygen, so instead of your blood cells picking up that oxygen from your lungs, it will pick up that carbon monoxide, and that pulse ox is still going to read it as 98% um, SpO2, 100% SpO2. But it's not the oxygen that is being transported throughout the body. It's carbon monoxide. So you want to go ahead and slap some oxygen on that patient's face. So you want to go ahead and put that patient on a Nava breather with some oxygen at 15 liters per minute uh, via uh, oxygen tank. <coughs> so like I said, the pulse ox will give a pulse reading. The pulse ox works by reading the color of the hemoglobin, hemoglobin um, when oxygen is attached. Um, the pulse ox sees the blood as red and gives the SpO2, SPO2 reading. Carbon monoxide boosts O2 off the hemoglobin and turns it and turns it very very red. So it may give you a reading of 100% or above, and the patient is still very hypoxic. So like I said, it has a stronger affinity than oxygen, so it can definitely boot oxygen out of the line for that next red blood cell and put itself on there. Common side effects you might see with uh, carbon monoxide exposure, the patient complaining of headache, uh, tachnipia, this is somebody breathing very rapidly, um, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, altered mental status, confusion is an early sign, and just if they're unresponsive, then it's a late sign, like they've, they've been exposed to carbon monoxide for a while now, um, and you'll, you would evidently see a high pop stock treating so an SpO2 greater than 94% as, as common with someone being exposed to carbon monoxide. So just keep in mind, even though the SpO2 might look normal, normal, you need to still put this patient on oxygen. And this is after they were removed from, from uh, the scene. Uh, this is, you know, showing you an insect stinging a person. So this is considered an injection. Um, injection poisons enters the body through the break of the skin, usually by intentional injection or a sting or bite from an animal insect. Um, you, so you want to just make sure when it comes to the patient assessment, once again, make sure you're seeing it safe. Um, you want to take the patient out of that toxic environment. So, you know, Normally, firefighter might remove them from the uh, the scene, the toxic environment, before you get to them. If in this case, if the O2 is less than 94%, go ahead and put them on oxygen. If it's greater than 94% and patient is alert and awake, you can probably withhold the, the oxygen. Get, you want to get a good history, so you know, get that sample question, you know, get the OPQST if they are experiencing some type of pain. Um, ask them if they are allergic to any animals or insects um, and find out the time last between injection and onset of signs and symptoms. So they're like, I got stung by a bee at 4 o'clock and it's now 4.50 and I'm starting to feel like an itchy throat and my arm is starting to hurt and it's red in the area where I got stung, you know, stuff like that is good to know. And then this one is showing you some, some uh, worker got some type of powder substance on him. 
Uh, and this is dangerous because, like we said, this is that absorption. So if it was to stay on the skin, the skin will eventually absorb the chemicals and it will enter the blood system. So you want to make sure you have on your proper PPE, uh, remove the patient from the environment. If the SPO2 is less than 94% on this patient, you want to put them on supplemental oxygen as well. Um, when it comes to powders and uh, powders and other like chemicals, especially well, when it comes to like dry substance on the skin, we do not want to put water to rinse it off because typically water might actually activate it and cause further damage to that person's skin. So you always want to just brush away, brush it away and away like from you as well. Uh, once the substance is off of the, the person's skin, you can go ahead and irrigate the affected area for at least 20 minutes. Common signs and symptoms of this is, you know, history of exposure to a poisonous substance, traces of liquid or powder, on the patient's skin, burns, itching and or irritation, redness and swelling. All right. So now we're going to get into um, drug and alcohol emergencies. Right. So, drug abuse is defined as the self-administration of drugs or a single drug in manner that is not in accord with approved medical or social patterns. A drug or alcohol overdose is a medical emergency due to the potential reactions that can occur. In the field, you will encounter habitual drug users that overdose in our and also accidental overdose due to miscalculations by patients taking their prescribed medicines. Um, also, someone that is taking more than one medication at a time um, or more than one prescribed medication at a time, we call that polypharmacy, which is uh, another cause or reason why you might see like a drug emergency, overdose emergency. And typically, this is in that older generation, mama and papa, that have 10 pills they take on an average day, and they're not even sure they can tell you the first three half the time. <clears throat> so drug and alcohol emergency indicators. So these are just some, some things you might see that might want to make you lean more towards that this is possibly a drug or alcohol overdose. You know, coming up to someone and they're unresponsive. And just, you know, this patient cannot not be awakened from what appears to be a deep sleep of, or a coma. Um, if awakened, they are only awake for a short period of time and almost immediately relapses into an unresponsive state. So this is either somebody that you just can't wake up at all, no matter um, how loud you yell or any type of painful stimuli you've done, they're not waking up. Or this is that person that does wake up, maybe after you rub on or stir on them, they wake up, but they only stay awake for like a few seconds and then they're falling back to sleep, you know, and you have to stone or rub them again or something to get them to wake back up and have to like keep waking them up you know you might see that a lot with specific drugs that can cause somebody to become very sleepy like a downer or something uh fever uh as a guide it may be stated that any temperature above 100 or 38 degrees celsius falls into this category vomiting with altered mental status Patient vomits while not alert or unresponsive. The prime danger consists of the possibility that she may have occluded her airway or aspirate vomitus into the lungs. So that you know that's that's always dangerous when someone's not awake and alert and they begin to vomit. You always want to think her airway or his airway is in danger. <coughs> Respiratory difficulties. Patient may be having a very weak, strong or weak cycles or may stop altogether. Inhalation or expiration may be noisy. The patient's skin is bluish. That means that there's some type of hypoxia going on. Patient's not receiving enough oxygen. Um, but their absence of cyanosis does not necessarily mean that respiratory difficulties are not severe. Your pulses, depending on what they take in, could be, their heart rate could be fast, tachycardic, 
or it can be slow, bradycardic, or it could be irregular, you know, <clears throat> in seizures. Um, once again, depending on what they're taking, they can have what we you will see muscle rigidity, spasms, twitching of the face, muscles, or extremities. Um, just that convulsion and jerk like movement, you know, that can all just be a reaction from some type of drug that they've taken. When it comes to seizures, you want to remember to clear your clear the patient of any furniture that may cause more injury to themselves. Um Depending on the drug the patient has taken, the patient could be tachycardic. Some, some drugs that can cause tachycardia, or we call them stimulants. That's your drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine. Or bradycardia, like I said, which is your depression drugs. And you can see this with opiates, sedatives, alcohols, benzos, things like that. <laughs> so in this case, if patient is not awake or alert at all, you always want to just go straight into your ABCs. Make sure your airway is open and protect your patient's airway. You know, check the breathing. If it's irregular, go ahead and provide um, positive pressure ventilation and circulation. You know, um, make sure there's no bleeding anywhere. Um, if they're if they're cool, clammy, and diaphoretic, treat them for shock stuff like that. So not. Not every emergency when it relates to drugs and alcohol is because that patient is currently um, on that particular uh, substance. We do see what we call alcohol withdrawal syndrome, uh, which can be another emergency. Um, typically, you know, this, this type of alcohol the patient is using is re irrelevant whether it's beer, hard liquor, or wine, alcoholics abuse alcohol in many forms, including mouthwash and rubbing alcohol. Alcoholics are prone to injury, most commonly chronic subdural hematomas from falling. Uh, um, alcoholics can also suffer from what we call, like I said, the alcohol withdrawal syndrome. There's different stages of alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Stage one occurs within eight hours with symptoms of nausea, insomnia, sweating, and tremors. Insomnia meaning that this patient is, is having a hard time sleeping. They can't sleep. You know, any and everything is keeping them awake, stuff like that. Stage two will occurs with eight to 72 hours um, with the same symptoms, only worse and accompanied by hallucinations. Stage three is as early as 48 hours follow, following the last drink and is characterized by major seizures, which we call those seizures delir delirium tremors, um, constitutes the most extreme form of alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Less severe form includes alcoholic trim tremors. <clears throat> Pretty much it looks like your patient might just be having like one big old seizure. Um, and stage four can occur within one to 14 days of that patient's last drink. And this is when you also still see the delirium tremors and stuff like that. The last stage of alcohol withdrawal syndrome is, like I said, is a severe life-threatening condition with a mortality rate of five to 15%. A single episode can last from one to three days alone. So, you know, typically, if family tells you, like, you know, they were not, like, their last drink was this, they have a history of drinking, and they were trying to quit, especially when they try to quit cold turkey without proper treatment, you want to think this patient might be going through alcoholic withdrawal syndrome. All right, so then we have opiate overdose. You know, like I said, so opiate overdose is typically like your people who are overdosing on some type of pain medicine, and typically they uh, inject it into themselves. Um, opiate mimics the effects of morphine. Morphine is pretty much a pain medicine. Um, the term opiate itself is derived from the plant opium. And just think narcotics, 
or uh, central nervous system depression. So they slow everything down. You're going to see a decrease uh, respiratory rate, stuff like that, which makes you want to um, go straight into positive pressure ventilation. You know, so you always want to assess your patient, manage your ABCs, and if you are led to believe that this patient has overdose or a family has straight up told you this patient has overdose, you know, go ahead and provide that proper treatment that we do carry and um, we carry uh, what we call naxalone or Narcan which can reverse the effects of the um, opiate overdose and pretty much we're going to give that to reverse the effect that it has on the respiratory system. We want to help improve that patient's uh, respiratory rate and pattern. Uh, we don't give Narcan to wake the patient up. So we're not going to keep giving them uh, Narcan after Narcan after Narcan. You know, we normally give the max two uh, milligrams and then we treat from there. You know, so if patient still isn't waking up or if the patient's respiratory rate still hasn't improved, we're going to continue to bag until his respiratory rate or pattern doesn't improve. And if he wakes up three to five minutes after we gave the Narcan, and he's awake or alert, you know, might slightly be confused. We can probably go from bagging him to a normal breather, you know, or a nasal cannula and just monitor until we get to the hospital. But common signs and symptoms of opiate overdoses, you will see, like I said, depression on the central nervous system. So they might even have like, if they are awake, delayed, reaction to your questions like they might stay off into space after you ask them something and be two to three minutes before they actually give you an answer um like respiratory depression um they will have the uh, constricted pupils and stuff like that treatment for us is to like i said open and maintain that airway provide positive pressure ventilation if necessary and if the SpO2 is less than 94%, you want to go ahead and give them some oxygen and then administer your Narcan. Contraindications of Narcan is if, that, if somebody is hypersensitive to it. So if someone has an allergic reaction to Narcan, you know, and someone else tells you that, then you probably want to hold off on giving that patient Narcan. Um, um, doses is 0 0.5 to 2 milligrams. Um, typically, we give a max of 1 milligram in each nostril um, via MAD device. And for a child, it's 0 0.5 in each nostril up to 1 milligram. Side effects of the Norcan after it's administered is an increase in blood pressure. The patient might have a headache, might have some pain, nausea, drop, uh, nausea, dryness, congestion, inflammation. Typically, you might see them throw up as well. So just be ready with your vomit bag, things like that. And typically, these patients are mean too. Like when you took away their high, so they're aggravated with you, stuff like that. <clears throat> this right here is just showing you somebody who is huffing on a chemical back there. You know, they put it inside that paper bag. He's uh, ensuring that the bag is sealed around his mouth and nose, and he's just inhaling. He's going to town with it. Um, intentionally, people do this on purpose to get high. Some, some chemicals are gasoline, paint, dusters. Uh, when patients huff these substances, they remove the oxygen from the alveoli and replace it with the chemicals of whatever they are inhaling, which can cause hypoxia. So you want to focus on removing the patient from the environment, provide oxygen, and if you need to control the airway, go ahead and control it and transport them to the hospital. All right, so chapter 23 is your abdominal, metallic, uh, gynecologic, and renal emergencies. So, 
so first link. So once again, just be familiar. Make sure you're familiar with your um, anatomy and physiology of like the GI system and the renal system. Make sure you know where these um, organs are located. What's in the upper and lower quadrants? What's in the upper right, upper left, lower left, lower right? What's considered um, retroperitoneal organs? You know, these are the organs that are behind other organs, stuff like that, like your kidneys, for some instance. <coughs> Um, and just remember, like, so for instance, the abdominal cavity is also aligned with peritoneal. Your visceral peritoneal is the innermost layer, and this is the layer that is actually covering the organs. Um, and your parietal layer is the outer, outer layer, um, which pretty much lines like the, um, the, uh, um, outer side of the, uh, organs. Most of the organs that are inside your abdominal cavity, like your stomach, spleen, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, small intestines, and parts of the large intestines are inside your peritoneal space, or what we call your intraperitoneal. And then your other organs, like your kidneys, uterus, or ureters, pancreas, and abdominal aorta are in your retroperitoneal space, or they are behind the peritoneal organs. <laughs> so this just shows you um, just more um, structures of the GI organs and your um, renal organs. So and then it gives you a table that has your hollow organs and your solid organs. And then you have your abdominal aorta and the inferior vena cava um, and your lower torso as well. Remember when it comes to your organs, that your solid organs like your kidneys, livers, um, if damaged from blunt force like getting hit with a baseball bat or something like that, um, you are at that patient's at risk of bleeding, severe bleeding. Um, how shallowed organs bleed out more. They're very vascular. Whereas your hollow organs normally contain some type of substance in it, which uh, for like your GI system is normally what we call bile um, content. So if these organs are ruptured and um, open, all of that bile can leak into your peritoneal system and cause and cause that human to go into what we call peritonitis. Referred pain. So referred pain pretty much means like um, that the patient could be complaining of pain somewhere opposite of where the actual injury or source of the pain is, is located. You know, they can be having pain in the right shoulder or like upper right chest. But it could be the gallbladder that's affected, which your gallbladder is located in your right upper quadrant stuff like that. So referred pain is normally like that the patient feels pain outside of the location of where the actual source of pain is coming from. <clears throat> Due to those two areas sharing uh, particular nerves and the uh, brain is just unable to identify where the source of pain, source of pain is coming from. So Referred pain is also called visceral pain or pain from that organ that is not felt in the organ itself, but instead at a different part of the body. Like I ended in the example I gave, the gallbladder is located in the right upper quadrant, but you may still feel pain that or that patient may still complain of pain in the right upper uh, shoulder or scapula, which is the right upper back. Pain from stretching a solid organ is usually a steady type of pain. Inflammation of a hollow organ can irritate the lining of the walls of the organ, causing a crampy type of pain. <laughs> All right, we're just going to go over a couple of these things. Um, but like acute abdominal pain could be 
of results of peritonitis, appendicitis, pancreatitis, uh, colicitis, which is gallbladder inflammation, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, gastroenteritis, peptic ulcer disease, intestinal obstruction, hernia, or triple A, abdominal aortic aneurysm. And remember, if this patient is a young female of childbearing age, you always want to um, have a high index of suspicion that the patient may be pregnant until proven not by you know medical staff members. So you always want to keep that in the back of your mind, but also just think maybe you know some type of sexual assault happened, vaginal bleeding, dysmenorrhea, um, which is like you know difficulty with uh, Periods, difficulty periods, or it is really bad periods, ovarian cysts, endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, or sexually transmitted disease. And then you also have your renal conditions, you know, a UTI, kidney stone, kidney failure, can also be reasons of patients complaining of abdominal pain. <laughs> With your kidney stones, you know, they typically complain of pain on that particular side, like if it's the right side that has a kidney stone, then they're going to complain of like right flank pain, which is like pain right underneath on the side of your um, side of your abdomen, like in, in between your stomach and back or vice versa. If it's on the left hand side, they're going to complain of left flank pain. For peritonitis, you know, um, is irritation and inflammation of the peritoneum. Uh, this occurs when blood, pus, or bacteria or chemical substance leaks into the peritoneal cavity. Common signs and signs and symptoms are abdominal pain or tenderness, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, fever and chills, uh, lack of appetite, or you can also do a positive. You can look for a positive Merkel test. Um, this is when you instruct the patient to stand on his feet with his knees straight. Then you ask the patient to raise his arms raise himself onto his toes and drop suddenly down on his heels, uh, flat-footed, with enough force to produce an audible thump. If they complain of excruciating pain by just doing that, then you, you should suspect some type of abdominal injury or peritonitis is involved. Um, so the first image is, you know, you're having that patient stand up on her toes and then they're going to instruct her to drop down to her heels and if she's complaining if she complains of pain shooting up all the way up to her uh, abdominal area then you would want to suspect have a high index of suspicion of some type of abdominal uh pathophysiology is going on Esophageal varices. Um, esophageal varices are a bulging engorgement or weakening of the blood vessels in the lining of the lower part of your esophagus. So this is dealing with the esophagus. Uh, this is common, commonly seen in alcoholic patients or patients with, the, with liver disease. It is caused by increased pressure in the venous blood system to the esophagus, liver, and stomach, usually identified with painless bleeding in the GI tract, so note they can be they can be bleeding out or you know have some severe bleeding going on, but they will never complain of you know abdominal pain. But you might see like a decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate, and stuff like that. So you might want to just think I need a treat for shock. Um, signs and symptoms: large amount of blood in their vomit. Um, Jaundice, which is the yellow yellowing of the skin or sclera from the liver disease. So sclera, as you can see in that picture with the man's eye, where your eye is typically white, it's all yellowish. And then his the picture below that shows like the yellowish on the patient's abdomen, stuff like that. It's a little swollen up in that um, abdominal area as well. Um, so those are just uh, things you can also look for. And it's for these type of patients, being that they are bleeding out, they might start coughing up blood and stuff like that. So just be ready to suction, have your proper PPE on, um, and be ready to maintain patient's airway if necessary.
All right, so then we have the abdominal aortic aneurysm, or what most people in the medical field would just call a triple A. Um, a triple A is a weakening, weakening balloon in, and enlarged area of the wall of the abdominal aorta. <coughs> so this being your aorta coming from the aortic parts that goes all the way down um, your GI tract and then it splits off into what you have your right and your left um, for more arteries. So this area right here that is now inflamed or more large than this area up here will be what we would consider your abdominal aortic aneurysm. And this is a medical emergency because this is a large artery. A lot of blood passes through here and if it bursts, the patient is going to bleed it out severely, quickly. And then you have in the next picture what we call your aortic dissection. This is typically when a small tear in the inner vessel structure which allows blood to leak between the walls of the aorta. The pressure in this dissection continues until the outer wall is damaged and blood leaks into the abdominal cavity. Um, these type of patients, you, the main thing you're probably going to hear them say is, I have tearing sensation, back pain, or lower back, flank, or pelvis. Like that tearing sensation, you might want to think abdominal aortic aneurysm or, you know, aortic dissection. Um, if the abdomen is soft and thin, um, you might be able to feel a pulsating mass. If, it, if you do suspect a AAA, do not assess, do not palpate on the abdomen because you do not want to irritate it. Oh, sorry. If you suspect the aneurysm, you need to treat for shock and transport the patient immediately. This is that, put the, press the gas pedal down to the flow, get them to the hospital as soon as possible. All right, so dialysis. So dialysis is usually a treatment performed on patients who have kidney um, failure. Their kidneys are unable to filtrate um, and regulate how they normally, how they're supposed to. Uh, the book describes dialysis as an artificial process used to remove water and waste substance from the blood. When the kidneys fail to function properly, there's um, two types of dialysis that we typically will see. <clears throat> your peritoneal and hemodialysis. Um, hemodialysis is the one we typically will see at dialysis centers and stuff like that. And the reason for dialysis is, you know, like I said, the kidneys are unable to get rid of the waste. Um, we don't produce the urine like they're supposed to. Dialysis removes the fluid and filters the waste. Patients who miss patients who miss dialysis will have fluid overload, resulting in pulmonary edema. So these are your type of patients. When you go to listen to their lungs, you might hear the crackles at the base of their lungs because they're having what we call fluid overload. Um, they're unable to get rid of that excess urine, urine because their kidneys aren't working properly and they miss dialysis last dialysis appointment. Um, but just keep in mind that a patient who is getting dialys dialysized could also go into an emergency. They're at risk of hypotension. Um, they might complain of muscle cramps, peritonitis, nausea and vomiting, hemorrhage, and difficulty breathing. <clears throat> Always ask, you know, people or patients, you know, is it okay to take a blood pressure on this arm without, they'll let you know, you know, you can't do one on this arm because I have a fistula or a shunt. You have to use the other arm. Try to go through this. My battery's about to die. All right, environmental emergencies. <coughs> so,
All right, so environmental emergency. So normal body temperature for a human is approximately 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, you know. Um, organs like your hypothalamus helps to regulate uh, your body temperature because it's const constantly monitoring um, your central receptors and your peripheral thermal receptors. The central, re central receptors, you know, measure the core's body temperature by monitoring the temperature of your blood. And your per per peripheral receptors monitor the body temp found in your skin and your extremities. I can't go back. All right. So, uh, we're going to get into it. But heat loss, um, there's different types of heat loss. There's four. Um, first one is radiation, which is known as the most significant way of heat loss. This is when you give off body heat without touching anything. Um, think newborn babies. Uh, they're always covered up with a beanie and a blanket. We don't want them to lose too much body heat. Very important. We keep them warm. Um, then you have conduction. Conduction, this is where the body heat is lost by touching nearby objects. Think of how cold you are when your clothes are wet. You're losing body heat faster than normal because of the wet clothes are conducting heat away from your body. It's like your body's trying to warm your clothes up because your clothes are soaking wet. And then you got convection, which causes small air molecules that are in immediate contact with your skin to become warm. So it's kind of like as the wind blows and it's chilly and it hits your skin, your skin is trying to give off heat to the wind to uh, warm up the wind. But now you're losing heat and you're getting cold by the wind. And then evaporation is a process in which a liquid changes to a vapor. Heat absorbs by sweat and dissipates into the air. <clears throat> it's typically, you know, when you're outside in heat working or something like that, you typically... Typically, you're starting to sweat to cool yourself off. Um, so in general, thermal control is lost when the body temperature is, is lower than 95, 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. And known the most important phases of management with hypothermic patients is the first 30 minutes following rescue and during the transport time to the hospital. So you need to know the stages of hypothermia that in the book um, as well. Stage one, shivering is a response by the body to generate heat. It does not occur below a body temperature of less than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty much if the human body is less than 90, they're not going to sit there and shake and shiver to warm themselves up. <clears throat> you have stage two with the decreased muscle function. Um, fine First, fine motor function is affected, then gross motor function is affected. So fine motor function is like them being able to pick up a penny from the ground. And then gross motor is like pretty much them being able to walk and stuff like that. You know, they, they lose that functional ability. Um, decreased level of responsiveness is accompanied by a glassy stare and possible freezing of the extremities. Decreased vital signs include slow pulse and slow respiratory rate. And then eventually, stage five is death. Urban hypothermia. Uh, this occurs in those who have uh, predispositions or disability or an illness. Um, example, someone laying on the floor in an air-conditioned um, building. So just think about my mom or papa who's falling and her AC is on and they're on the ground, um, unable to get up on their own. They're going to just sit there and their body is going to give the body, the body is going to transfer the body heat from them to the floor because the floor is colder than them. So it's like they're losing their heat to the floor. And eventually they're going to go into hypothermia and hypothermic shock. And if not um, found soon enough, they're going to go and just pretty much freeze to death. They're going to be, they're going to hit that stage five. They're going to go through all those stages and hit stage five. Top priority after finding someone um, who's been on the floor for 
a few hours or anything like that, it's always your ABCs. That's your top priority. You want to remove the patient from the cold environment and help reduce any further heat loss. So covering them with a blanket if necessary. You want to handle the patient gently. Don't have them stand and walk to the stretcher. This can put them in a dysrhythmia, what we call refib. And you want to transport them supine if possible. Um, we have active rewarming and passive rewarming. You want to active rewarm somebody, which is rewarming the core of the body of moderate and severe hypothermic patients. So you want to rewarm someone who we classify as moderate or severe hypothermic aggressively, actively. Um, this is wrapping a patient in warm blankets, placing heat packs or hot water bottles in the groin, in the armpits, or even on the chest, turning up the heat in the module of the truck. So turning up the heat in the ambulance altogether is actively rewarming. You have your local code injury, which we call pretty much frostbite. Um, little guy tells you signs and symptoms. Frostbite, most common locations for frostbites are your hands, your feet, nose, cheeks. Um, treatment, you do not want to rub the injured tissues. Only be warm if no chance of freezing again. So if you warm up their hand, you, know, you want to make sure you keep that hand warm. Don't expose it to any cold factors again, stuff like that. Um, passively, we warm. Is the first priority. Just wrap the patient in blankets to reduce any more heat loss. So you don't need to throw no hot bottles of water on them and stuff like that. Just wrap them up, get them out of the cold environment, and transport them. Um, all right. So hyperthermia. So this is the body, you know, temperature being greater than 98.6 degrees. You know, there's different types of hyperthermia. We have heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Heat stroke being the most, more severe one. <clears throat> With heat cramps, you will see profuse sweating, um, thought to be the result of overexertion of muscles, a lactic acid buildup, so it might cause cramping, um, patients losing too much salt through sweat. Might see, might see a decrease in blood pressure, increase in heart rate from that. Whereas heat exhaustion is prolonged and profuse sweating causes the body to lose a large amount of salt and water. You will see vasodilation, which is also going to be a decrease in your blood pressure. Blood circulation diminishes. The body cooling mechanisms have been exhausted and now other systems are starting to be affected. So the body's unable to cool itself off. This patient might stop sweating. And it's not because they remove themselves from the heat source. It's just because their body has um, been worn out trying to cool themselves off. And now it's like unable to do so. So this person is just getting worse. Um, if that same person continues to stay outside in the heat, eventually they're going to fall into what we call heat stroke. This is a life-threatening condition. Um, Thermoregulating systems have failed. This patient is not sweating. They're probably not going to even really be hot to the touch when you touch them. They're going to probably be cool. Um, cool, dry skin, you know, pale looking due to the decrease in blood pressure and stuff like that. You want to move the patients to a cool environment um, and use cold packs, stuff like that, and the armpits growing. Turn the AC on in the back of the truck. You want to cool them off immediately. All right, so drowning emergencies. Um, typically, this is also something that's commonly seen in children, young teenagers, young adults, you know, being swim parties or pool parties, stuff like that, drinking and swimming, drinking and diving into pools is not a good mix, stuff like that. <laughs> So drowning is described as an incident in which someone is submerged or immersed in a liquid that results in a primary respiratory impairment. The liquid prevents the patient from breathing air. The patient might live or die from the event regardless of the outcome. It is termed as a drowning. <coughs> so in the image you see they're saying something goes wrong. They start to panic. They panic until their body becomes fatigued. Um, and then they're 
pretty much they're tiring out their body, they're unable to breathe efficiently, uh, sufficiently, I'm sorry. Um, decreased buoyancy, so they're unable to fight against the water, and eventually they might drown, go into cardiac arrest, stuff like that might happen, you know, get it entangled into plants or whatever, you know, if they're swimming in the body, whatever's in there, getting caught up on something, flipping a kayak or pure rock, and being unable to um, emerge from it, stuff like that. And this is an algorithm that just shows you, you know, how to manage someone who has drowned. So Boyle's law states that the volume of gas is inversely related to the pressure. An increase in pressure leads to a decrease in volume of the gas. If the pressure decreases, the volume of the gas decreases. If a diver takes a breath underwater and then ascends quickly, the volume can increase, causing barrel trauma. Dalton's law states the deeper the diver goes, the pressure of nitrogen inhale increases and eventually dissolves into the blood. This affects the brain function of the diver and can produce nitrogen narcosis. It's as if they are under a light anesthetic. Every 50 feet of depth is equivalent to one alcoholic drink, affecting the diver's impairment. And then Henry's law states the amount of gas that dissolves in a liquid it is in contact with is proportion, proportionate to the pressure of gas around it. When a diver descends, pressure increases, the nitrogen inhaled dissolves into the body liquid, mainly the plasma. If the diver comes up too quick, the nitrogen returns to the gaseous state and think this creates bubbles in the blood. This is also known as decompression sickness or the bends. <clears throat> so, you know, just uh, when it comes to drowning and stuff like that, like hypo may occur. Just no, no one's pronounced dead until they're warm and dead. So you have to warm the body up, stuff like that. You know, um, might be a cardiac arrest. Might be working a cold, stuff like that. Just prepare yourself. Want to just go ahead and remove the wet coat uh, clothing from the patient. Like I said, um, wet clothing causes hypothermic hypothermia by conduction, stuff like that. So remove them from the cold source, remove them from the water, remove them from their wet clothing, dry them off, try to keep them warm, things like that. You know, provide positive pressure ventilation if need be, or just oxygen via normal breather if need be, and transport. Behavior emergencies. So when it comes to behavior emergencies, you always want to make sure you have local law enforcement or just law enforcement on scene before your arrival. Um, if you're seeing, if you are on scene and the scene is has become unsafe, you want to remove yourself from the scene. Remember, your you and your partner safety is priority. Um, <clears throat> but you always, even on scene, any scene, you always want to stay alert. Um, of impending violence. You never know when something can just go wrong. Remember, you and your partner's safety is top priority. Early signs of a patient who might become combative um, is nervous, or like them pacing back and forth, them shouting, shouting threatening, cursing, clenched teeth, or fists. Um, you need to rule out medical or trauma. You know, the patient was involved in a car accident, something like that, and it looks like they probably hit their head, you know, a head bleed can cause a patient to become combative, stuff like that, you know, or um, changes in the patient's blood sugar. If it's too low, a blood sugar might can cause a patient to become combative and confused. You know, it's not always someone just not acting right because of like drugs or anything like that. It could also just be from either a trauma incident, like a car accident, or they might be a diabetic and their blood sugar is too low. <clears throat> so
So unless it's necessary, you want to avoid restraining the patient. But if the patient is a danger to himself and others, you want to go ahead and provide, put the patient on four point restraints. Um, never place anything over the face or the neck and never put the patient in a prone position.